my praise to you as a pleasing sacrifice. Lord, I offer you my life. Things in the past, things yet unseen, wishes and dreams done. Kaprobinsyaan ang Pambansang Awit ng Pilipinas.
Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Manilin. Can you hear my voice? Hi, ma'am. Good afternoon. Yes, I can hear your voice. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And good afternoon for all uh, participants of the second session of International Lecture Series. Uh, we are still waiting for uh, another speaker, which is uh, who is Bu Dr. Sokman Adini to join this Zoom uh, meeting. So at one shot, we will start our session. We still have uh, five minutes more. For the operator, Mbak Natasha, would you please play uh, what's that? The Mars of Dimsu and Mars of Ukris. Hello, Mbak Natasha. Or probably the, the profile, yeah, video profile of Ukris and Dimsu. Thank you. Jimsu, at a glance. Don Mariano Marcos Memorial State University, or Jimsu, is the lone state university in La Union, Philippines. Jimsu was created through Presidential Decree 1778 on January 15, 1981, by former President Ferdinand E. Marcos. Founded on the philosophy, total human development with appropriate competencies, Jimsu was born from the merging of five former schools of La Union, namely Don Mariano Marcos Memorial State College at Bacnotan La Union, La Union School of Arts and Trade at City of San Fernando La Union, Community College of La Union at City of San Fernando La Union, Southern Ilocos Polytechnic State College at Agoo La Union, and Sapilang Elementary School at Bacnotan La Union. The university has three major campuses, namely the North La Union Campus in Bacnotan, the Mid La Union Campus in San Fernando City, and the South La Union Campus, which is called in the towns of Agoo, Santa Tomas, and Rosario La Union. Jimsu also houses the Open University System, which is located in San Fernando City, La Union. Jimsu is the home of two national centers, the National Apiculture Research, Trading and Development Institute, or NARTDI, and the Sericulture Research and Development Institute, or SRDI, anchored in seven core values, namely service, productivity, excellence, commitment, innovativeness, advocacy, and leadership. Jimsu envisions to become a globally competitive university and is empowered to provide high-quality instruction, research, and extension. Its undiminished goal is to lead in transforming human resources into productive, self-reliant citizens and responsible leaders. Living with its mantra, embracing world-class standards, Jimsu is ISO certified. Through the strong leadership of the current president, Dr. Jaime E. Pacman Weld Jr. and the Vice Presidents and the teamwork and commitment of all Dimsu personnel. Dimsu passed ISO 9001-2015 on November 19, 2020. The audit scope includes the provision of instruction, research, extension, and support services. Overall, 24 processes were audited. The ISO 9001-2015 Certificate Number 20.67.PH112906.00 originally approved on November 19, 2020, was issued on November 29. Further, on November 8-12, 2021, 
Dynasty passed the first surveillance audit and the certificate attesting that the University QMS conforms to the requirements of ISO 9001-2015, number 20.67.PH112906.01, was issued on November 29, 2021. As an affirmation of DIMSU's excellent systems, it rewards in recognition, learning and development, and recruitment selection and performance management. The Philippine Civil Service Commission, or CSC, conferred DIMSU with certificates of recognition. These implies that the three systems have reached maturity level 2. Also, Jimsu's North Lonian campus passed the Institutional Sustainability Assessment by the Commission on Higher Education. Jimsu has 109 academic programs broken down into 13 doctorate degree programs, 31 master's degree programs, 58 baccalaureate degree programs, and 7 diploma or certificate programs. In addition, the university boasts of 20 academic programs that have been pre-accredited to level 4 status by the Accrediting Agency of Chartered Colleges and Universities of the Philippines, or AACCUP. These programs are BS Agroforestry, Bachelor of Elementary Education, BS Agribusiness Management, BS in Environmental Science, BS in Information Systems, PhD in Technological Education Management, MA in Technology Education, PhD in Development Administration, MDA Majors in Business Administration and Public Administration, BS Industrial Technology, BS in Hospitality Management, BS in Business Administration, PhD Science Education, MA in Science Education, MA in Mathematics Education, M.A. in Teaching Music, M.A. in Guidance and Counseling, B.S. Mathematics, B.S. Biology, B.S. Computer Science. Likewise, 18 programs are Level 3 re-accredited, 15 are Level 2 re-accredited, and 22 are Level 1 accredited. New program offerings have also been subjected to preliminary survey visit for the assessment of their readiness for accreditation. Because of DIMSU's rigorous engagement in accreditation endeavors, DIMSU was recognized by AACCUP as top one in the highest number of Level 4 accredited programs in 2020, top two in the highest in number of Level 3 accredited programs in 2020, Top 3 in the highest number of Level 4 accredited programs in 2019 and Top 3 in the highest number of Level 1 accredited programs in 2021. Moreover, the Colleges of Education, Information Technology and Computer Science are recognized by the Commission on Higher Education as Centers of Development. Jimsu implements strong programs for faculty, staff and student development it initiates numerous trainings to upskill and cross-skill and to equip and empower its 577 faculty members and 514 non-teaching personnel. To provide a quality environment and to ensure quality processes, Jimsu continues to build state-of-the-art infrastructure projects equipped with cutting-edge tools, equipment and machineries. In fact, Jimsu is already gearing towards becoming a smart university. As a result of quality curriculum, quality processes, and quality academic environment, Jimsu has been producing quality graduates who are among the most preferred graduates in the Philippines and abroad. What's more, Jimsu maintains excellent performances in various licensure examinations. In fact, Jimsu ratings in licensure examinations are much higher than that of the national passing rates. For the past several years, Jimsu has produced top-notchers in national board examinations in the fields of mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, agriculture, fisheries, agricultural engineering, veterinary medicine, forestry, teacher education, psychology, guidance and counseling, midwifery, and master electrician. What's more, as surveyed by the Commission on Higher Education in 2001, Jimsu ranked among the top 10 higher education institutions in the Philippines and seventh among the more than a thousand private and public colleges and universities in the Philippines. Areas evaluated were faculty, 
student admission, library, academic offerings, research and extension. Jimsi was also listed in the CHED 2011-2016 to Roadmap for Public Higher Education Reform as one of the 19 leading state universities and colleges in the Philippines. As for research, Jimsi's research program is one of the biggest programs in northern Luzon in terms of the number of ongoing research undertaken and budget allocation. Its research commodities include fiber crops, fruit crops, beef and chevin, pork, Orchids, bamboo, agroforestry, poultry, agricultural engineering, farming system, applied rural sociology, macroeconomics, purple yam, bananas, sericulture, and apiculture. In fact, Dimsu has recently been named by DOST PCAARRD as top intellectual property filer. Meanwhile, extension programs of the university are anchored in commodity-based services that create an impact on the life of the clientele in terms of productivity, profitability, and services for the enhancement of local government and non-government organizations. Dimsu Techno Pinoy, also known as Farmer Information and Technology Services or FITS has been named by the Philippine Council for Agriculture, Aquatic and National Resources Research and Development as one of the country's active and functional centers. Kapihan Sidimsu, an extension program which is aired online, has also been reaching thousands of clientele. Acknowledged for its distinct competence, expertise and resources, Jimsu is home to a number of special projects. These include the Sericulture Research and Development Institute or SRDI, the National Apiculture Research Training and Development Institute or NARTDI, Fisheries Research and Training Institute or FRTI, Jimsu Pig Extension and Research Farm or DPERF, and the Philippine Carabao Center or PCC. The Affiliated Non-Conventional Energy Center, the Metal Crafts and Innovation Center, and the Agri-Aqua Technology Incubation Center. At present, the university is sprawled on a 1,120-hectare land area, cozily splintered in seven major units. The Central Administration, the National Apiculture Research Training and Development Institute, the Sericulture Research and Development Institute, the North Union Campus, the Mid Union Campus, the South Lonian Campus and the Open University System. True to its goal of transforming human resources into productive, self-reliant citizens and responsible leaders, Jimsu takes pride in its commitment in fulfilling its vital role in the country's national development. Universitas PGRI Semarang is located in the culturally strong Semarang City, Central Java Province, Indonesia. With these features, Semarang is a potential place for students to develop themselves. The spirit that drives Universitas PGRI Semarang is nationalism and religiosity. Nationalism is the spirit to unite the nation in the midst of culture differences. We have seven faculties consist of Faculty of Education This faculty is the oldest faculty at our campus with the largest number of students. It has three study programs, the Guidance and Counseling Study Program, Elementary School Teacher Education, and Early Childhood Development Teacher Education. Faculty of Social Science and Sports Education there are several points that become our focus in this faculty. First, the value of humanism as national identity. Second, physical health as a support for quality education. Third, the understanding of economic values as a pillar of human civilization. This faculty has three study program, Pancasila and Citizenship Civil Education, Physical and Recreational Education, and economic education faculty of language and arts this faculty provides education to generate language and art educators with pedagogical personal social and professional competence and competitive abilities in dealing with the current aid development in order to develop themselves into professionals such as translator newscasters or journalists by making use of their language and artistic skills. This faculty has three study programs, 
Indonesian Language and Literature Education, English Education, Regional Language and Literature Education, Javanese Language, Faculty of Mathematics, Science, and Information Technology Education. This faculty has study programs of Mathematics Education, Biology Education, Physics Education, and Information Technology Education. The vision of this faculty is to be an excellent and distinguished faculty of mathematics, natural science, and information technology education by 2025. Faculty of Engineering and Informatics, established on April 17, 2014. This faculty has six study programs, namely Architecture, Mechanical Engineering, Civil Engineering, Electrical Engineering, Informatics, and Food Technology. Faculty of Economic and Business This faculty has a mission to be a faculty of economics and business that excels in the field of digital base, creative economics and business with a distinctive identity. Faculty of Law the Faculty of Law of University of Begir Ismarang is committed to develop legal knowledge and this is done, among others, by organizing seminars, discussions, comparative studies, and field experience practices. In order to support the teaching and learning activities, we have four complexes of campuses. Campus 1, located at Jalan Dr. Cipto Jalan Lontar. This campus consists of representative and modern buildings for teaching and learning activities. This campus consists of central building, main building, student activity center, library, graduate program building, as well as a representative auditorium meeting hall for national class concerts and international seminars. Campus 2, located at Jalan Sriwijaya. This campus has a hotel available for both students and public in general, as well as a large meeting room for teacher professional training programs and various other large-scale meetings. Campus 3, located at Jalan Bendan Duo. This campus has a building for students' practices, especially mechanical and electrical engineering department students. This campus supports various activities to increase electrical, mechanical, and architecture skills. Campus 4, located at Jalan Gajah. This campus has a teaching learning building complex and a sports centers including basketball, badminton, futsal, and other athletic sports activities. This campus also has a dormitory building provided for students as well as a high school laboratory school which was established by the Universitas Peger Ismara. Why do you have to choose Ugris as a place to study? We realize the importance of international relations to connect the discourse currently developing in the international world. This is where we establish a collaboration to open up opportunities for career later through students and lecture exchanges, credit transfer and double degree program, joint internship and research, and publication with our reputable university partners. We believe that in our fast-paced and competitive world, there are basic competencies every young generation has to possess, namely excellence and distinction, excellence in either emotional and spiritual intelligence, and the ability to retain the personality as a culture human being. Please join Ogris. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Cheer speakers. Masuk semua. Dear speakers, dear colleagues, and then dear participants of the second session of the International Lecture Series.
Yeah. Uh, actually, it is the collaboration between Universitas PGRI Semarang and Don Mariano Marcos Memorial State University. On behalf of the director of OPRIS International Office, I'm Siti Sofia. I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you for taking the time to attend this event. It gives me a great pleasure to be the moderator for this event, and I'm excited to be hosting it. Uh, in this session, we have an, an, uh, an exciting panel of speakers lined up for today, and we hope that you will find their presentations and discussions informative and engaging. Um, the first presentation will be delivered by Dr. Manilin R. Kakanindin. Yeah. And continued by Ibu Dr. Sukma Nur Ardini SSMPD. And then each speaker will present a topic for about 45 minutes. After both presentation, it will be continued by question and answer session. And for uh, the question and answer session, the participants can write down the question on the chat box, or you can directly asking question by clicking the button of raised hand. Uh, before I call upon the first speaker, I would like to uh, tell you about her curriculum vitae. Yeah. The first speaker is Dr. Manilin R. Kakanindin, and then she has the teaching experience from 2016 up to present. And then uh, for her educational attainment, he got, he, uh, he got her doctoral degree uh, as a doctor of philosophy in language education in 2020. Yeah. And then after that, yeah, she also joining many uh, conventions, conferences, trainings, seminars, workshops, forum, and colloquium. Yeah. And uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, her major is in English language, yeah. And then it will have the relation with her topic today that she will deliver, that is about the language of new age media. Okay, now uh, I will invite Dr. Manilin Kakanindin to deliver the topic, the language of new age media for about 45 minutes. Okay, please. Thank you, Mom Sisi. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, yeah. yes, you can. Thank you, may I just share my screen? Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can see my presentation. Okay. So for this afternoon, I will be sharing a bit of information about the language of New Age uh, media. So the sharing or the sharing of the language of New Age media will be focused on the perspective of language people or linguists or people who study language. So I hope uh, it would be okay with everyone if um, um, we will be discussing theories and different concepts regarding the language of new age uh, media. Now our roadmap for this 45 minute presentation will begin with a definition of what new media is or new age media is. I believe that our students are very much acquainted and they have a lot of experience actually they experience this every day. We definitely use the new media every day in education, in entertainment, and in other forms of communication. And then we also have, okay, we also have audience interaction and participation as part of the discussion, who are the audience we are referring to? What kind of interaction takes place in the use of the new media? And what participation do we provide? Who are we in the interaction? 
And then we also have, this is a, a very important, or these are very important concepts, the truth. We also have the term post-truth. So how is post-truth different from the truth? And of course, we also have the observation of the lies. And the last topic that we'll be discussing later would be the offensive language and the tactics used in, uh, or the tactics of resistance. How do we actually filter what uh, the communication that we receive through the new media? Okay, so these are the one, two, three, four topics that we will be discussing this afternoon. So let's first have um, one clear, united definition of new media. I believe that you already know this and you experience this already. So these new media are any media coming from newspaper articles and blogs to music and podcasts. Huh? Isn't that print media? It is not print media because it's delivered digitally. Okay, so these forms of media are delivered digitally from a website or through the use of an email to mobile phones, our mobile phones, through the streaming apps that we are using. And actually, any internet-related form of communication can be considered as new media. So now let's reflect. Are we familiar with new media? Do we experience new media? Definitely, even at this moment, we are using new media. So this would be the topic that we'll be talking about this afternoon. Uh, our discussion will be revolving on our experiences in new media. Now let's talk about new media as a resource of communication. Is it a resource of communication? What is our definition again of communication? This is when we send and receive messages. So in this part, we'll be talking about how we use new media to send or receive messages or information to communication. Okay, so a new media as a resource of communication, it is a wide or a, a, it is a very good resource of communication actually because it has a wide range of content. Does it have a wide range of content? Yes, it doesn't limit or it is not limited to one specific topic only. It's not limited to one language only. It's not limited to one uh, discipline only. It has a wide range of content and with a wide range of function as well. A while ago, I said, at this time, we're actually using new media. And this is one function of new media to inform people. So we are now using the new media to inform our students. We are having a discourse, actually, about new media. Other functions of new media as a source of communication would be to entertain people. This is what we usually like to do with the use of new media. After our work, we watch Netflix, or when we go to work, we use Spotify, or when we um, try to connect with our friends, we use Messenger or uh, other forms of uh, messaging. And it also is used formally, okay, as or to lecture students. It is used in education. It uh, it was formerly a part of the education, especially during the pandemic. New media is greatly used during the pandemic. May it be in entertainment, may it be in giving information, but especially in providing lectures to students. And there is another one that is also a very important characteristic of new media, which is its persuading skills. New media has a great persuading skills. We change our mind when we see something that is more beautiful in new media, or we evaluate okay, the information that we also have with the use of new media. So it has the power of persuasion. And new media. Well, please, I think my colleague left. 
Okay, noon here, yeah, comparing it to the common communication or type of communication or face-to-face -face communication that we usually use or comparing it to texts or language or books that we use as resource of communication, what makes it different is that first, it is multimodal. So when we say it is multimodal, it is combined or it combines the language or the text with the visual communication and sound. So do we have visual communication right now? You can see my screen. We are actually having a visual communication. You can see what I can see. I am showing you what I would like him to see. And you can hear me as well with the use of its audio. Comparing it to a book or printed magazine, there are some limitations that these prints are not able to provide us or to provide the readers for the viewers, which is very advantageous for new media. Another characteristic of new media is it is non-linear. When we say it is non-linear, it combines spatial and temporal characteristics. Okay, or spatial and temporal patterns. When I say spatial, it's referring to space. So most of our students, most of our audience at this time are coming from, or many of our students at this time are coming from Indonesia. You're very far, you are in another country. There are also students coming from the Philippines. I am coming from the Philippines, but we defy that. We um that, that is not a problem. Our physical distance is not a problem because of the new media. So that's the meaning of spatial pattern. We can okay. also go back and watch past videos or old videos, or we can also watch live, um, live streams coming from other countries, even if we are from another place. It's the meaning of spatial. For temporal patterns, this is focused on time. Okay, it's focused on time. We have different time um, right now in Indonesia and in the Philippines, but we are able to meet and talk and have this lecture through new media. We can also watch like, let's say, let's compare this to television shows. Most of the time, or in the Philippines, if you're watching through a television, there are specific or certain times that you can only watch a specific television show. But with the use of new media, you can watch whatever, whenever you like it. So that's another characteristic that's non-linear. And the third one, the third characteristic that makes new media very different from the language that we are using or from the usual form of communication that we are using is that new media is new indeed. Okay? It hasn't lived as, uh, as long as the language has been existing. Okay? It's, it's very new. It's almost the same as our age. Like when we were born, there's a time that new media was also born. So that's another characteristic. It's not as old as the other language that we are actually using the other language that we were born with already. So these are the three characteristics of new media as a resource of communication. If you have observed, multimodality, non-linearity, and being new, then that means what you are using, what you're experiencing is the new media. Now let's go to the rest of the characteristics of new media. I hope you're looking at the screen. I have here one, two, three, four, five, six other characteristics. We start with digital. Obviously, new media is digital. So here are its characteristics. It allows technological convergence. We can use new media through our cell phones. We can use our experience new media through our desktops. We can use new media through our laptops, or we can use new media through our iPads or other gadgets. So it allows technological convergence. It also allows technological 
improvement. Actually, new media is always ever-changing. There is always development. There is always something new. When we go to the new media that there we are using, there's always an update. Correct? Have you updated your laptops already? Have you updated your samples already? Have you updated um, the pages that you have subscribed to? Okay, so that is technological convergence. It also allows small storage and rapid communication. So when you say small storage and rapid communication, this could uh, we could make use of Messenger as an example. In our messengers, we actually send pictures, short videos, and messages to our friends or to our co-workers. Rapid communication without the need to meet face-to-face. -face. Okay, so that is digital and it is the opposite of analog. The second characteristic is its interactivity. If we refer to other or older media, most of the time it's just one way. We receive the information, we get the information, but we cannot or we do not give feedback. We are not allowed to give feedback. Or the person that is training or the, the film that is being shown doesn't receive our feedback. That is for the old media. But now for the new media, because of its interactivity, we are actually able to participate. It actually um, advocates partic participatory culture. So we experience other people's culture, other people experience our cultures. How is that? Through the giving of our feedback. How do you think did K-pop um, become famous? How do these people from other countries become known to another country? How do we know, let's say, the films or series from other countries? That is through the new media or our use of the new media. And how do they actually know that their films, their shows are being liked by other people? Through our participation, by liking, by following, or by giving our comments, or by giving hearts, or by posting as well, or sharing their videos, actually. So that is one characteristic that's interactivity. It's also hypertextual. When we say it's hypertextual, it's not the, the very common first page, second page, third page. No, it allows people to have more freedom of choice. I would like to skip. Okay, I would like to move to the middle of this video or I would like to check the end of this video. It gives us the freedom to choose, like or and through Spotify, for example, when we listen to music. I want to change the music that I am listening to because in, in radios, you cannot control that, correct? You cannot control that. But through the use or in uh, new media, we are allowed to choose what music we would like to listen to what video we would like to watch. So that's hyper textuality. And then we also have its virtual ability. Definitely, it's very opposite to the face-to-face -face reality. And it's also much faster in pacing. And because of that, this can actually be um, uh, a challenge to new media because it buys for more and more attention. That's why right now we already have the short clips, short videos, okay? Because they are trying to really control our attention as audiences. They're trying to let us think in using that new media. And it also, or people uh, present only, the, would you agree with this? People present only favorable sides of themselves. Or maybe we could reword it to uh, what we see in the new media most of the time are the favorable sides of people, the positive sides of people. Because it's not face to face. You do not, or you, oh, our view is limited, okay, in other words. So that's a virtual. For networking, networking is also one characteristic of new media. It allows us, just like this. Um, Diagram. You can see there 
the, the spreading of the vines or the stems of the new media. So that's also networking. It asks or allows more collaboration and more collective intelligence. We share our thoughts, we share our opinions, we share our ideas through new media. And definitely, this is a very obvious characteristic. It is global in scope. So that's why we are able to hear news or information about a country that is very far from us. That is through networking. But there is also the pressure and the question of power and network ups. What new media is more influential or what new media is more powerful? That's networking. And the last one is it's simulated. This is what I would like you to think about. And this is what I would like you to always realize when we use uh, new media. It is just a simulation. It is not as real as the face-to-face -face communication. It is not as real as the physical communication. Everything is virtual, okay? And everything is based on algorithms. When you look at the dictionary, you will see there that the definition of simulation is artificial something that is fake, something that is not real, okay? So this would be a good reminder to us that new media, yes, we get a lot of advantage, advantages from new media, but we always have to remember that it is just virtual and it is also simulated, okay? It is controlled by algorithms. So these are the main characteristics of new media. Now let's jump to the next topic, our participation as audience, the interaction that we experience, and the participation of the different roles involved in new media. Okay, so here we'll be focusing on the news of the use of new media to communicate with each other. Definitely. We, we have the advantage of reaching out to people who are not with us physically. We have the advantage of calling you know, our loved ones, our relatives from other countries. We are able to communicate and make friends with the use of new media. And it is also in a bigger spectrum or in a bigger view, in a more general view, it is actually a social interaction. Would you agree that the use of the new media is social interaction? How is it a social interaction check? Are you sending a message to another person? Are you receiving a message to another person? If you're watching, is someone sending you a message? Are you trying to be in a communication? So would you agree that media is a form of a social interaction? Okay, and the kinds and roles our kinds of roles and responsibilities in this communication. So it doesn't mean that we're able to express ourselves, we are able to share our thoughts. We are free to share whatever already. There are also the certain roles and very importantly, certain responsibilities in the form of new media communication that we are undertaking. Let's first focus first on the types of audience. Where are we? What kind of audience are we? Who are the audiences? Let's see if you're actually a part or if you're actually a type of an audience. So these audiences are the groups of people for whom messages are intended. So for a specific page or website or site, okay, there are certain Characteristics of people that they are targeting. There are certain types of people that they would like to watch or read or listen to what they are offering. They are also a representation or, or a source of revenue. 
they represent a source of revenue. So, ma'am, would you say that new media is related to business? I would like you to reflect on that later. Could, could new media be related to business? Is it business? So, in some books, they actually identify audiences as a source of revenue. Have you ever watched, or when you watch YouTube, for example, what do you observe at the beginning of or before the video begins? There are advertisements. And these advertisements, of course, sustain or help the side that you're watching um, be maintained. Okay, so that's just a simple um, example or explanation that audiences are a representation of a source of revenue. And they are also the most important factors determining media content. So whatever is placed in a specific site, whatever is being delivered, whatever is being offered, who determines that? It's the audience. The audience has the power to determine which or what media content must be delivered. Do you agree with that? Do we, do we agree with that, that it's the audience who decides what media or what new media actually produces? Okay. Now let's have the types of audiences. Okay. We have the first one. These are the addressees. These addressees are the target audiences. So I would say uh, I have this site, I have this page, and this site of audience that I would like to watch. Okay, so they are the addresses. And then we have another one, we also have the editors. Uh, by the way, by the way, the addresses are By the way, the addresses are known by the producers of the new media. The addresses are acknowledged by the producers of that new media and the addresses are identified. Different with auditors, these auditors are also known. They are also ratified. They are also acknowledged, but they are not addressed. Okay, the, the video, the products, or the music is not for them. But these producers know that they have auditors, they have evaluators, they check what is being produced. In the Philippines, we also have this. We have what we call MPRC, just for an example. We have uh, an organization who checks who filters, who uh, evaluates what should be streamed and what should not be streamed. So there are very good examples of auditors and then also have overhearers okay these overhearers they're identified but they are not uh they are not addressed and they are also not acknowledged but we know that they're there these are just the people who are not really interested in what we produce in the new media but we know that they're there they may have heard about it. They may have heard about the information. They may have heard about the product, but they are not interested, but they know it. And they are also known. And we also have what we call the eavesdroppers. droppers. These eavesdroppers droppers are unaddressed. Okay, so that's the opposite of addressed. They're also unratified. They are not acknowledged. And they are unknown. We just know that there are other people, but maybe they haven't heard about our page, or maybe they haven't uh, seen our site, or maybe they don't know about us as new media. So these are the types of audiences. And now let's go to audience segmentation. So if we have those types of audiences, we have the eavesdroppers, they haven't even heard about us they are unknown who are they or if we have overhearers can overhearers actually become addressers or addressees i should say can can overhearers or can uh, auditors also be our addressees because they may be potential addressees so we have the 
audience segmentation. This is how producers of new media target, select, pick, and look for their audience. So we have the identification of their demographics. So if I am, for example, an owner of a website or um, a streaming company or a networking company, I would like to have a specific audience. I will be using this audience segmentation first. I have to identify what age bracket. What age bracket is the target? Are you targeting children? Are you targeting college students? Are you targeting high school students or are you targeting professionals? Okay. Are you more on um, male perspectives or are you more on the preference of women? Okay, so that is for the demographics. So identify or new media identifies who or what are the characteristics of their target audience. Another uh, audience segmentation is in the form of psychographic segmentation. Here, the producer identifies the social class, the lifestyle, the attitudes of the target audience. Like, um, are you a party person? Or are you the nerdy type? Do you like reading? What are your hobbies? What's your lifestyle? What's your taste in, when it comes to art? So that is using psychographic segmentation. Another form of segmentation is behavioral segmentation. Here, the producers would see if you are loyal in a website. How loyal are you in the subscription that you are using? Or what is the maximum? How, how, how many hours do you... For example, stay in that streaming. How many hours is your website user? So they evaluate, they assess the actions and the behaviors of the audience. And finally, we have geographical. Definitely, even if new media or new age media is global, there are still certain places or certain continents that um, are in the limit of the reach of the new media. So these producers can study, can identify where are our viewers coming from? In what countries are they usually coming from? For example, Facebook. You know that Philippines is one of the highest user of Facebook. So there could be a reason behind that or may be um, presenting you know, some behavioral or psychographic characteristics of the audience. So this is audience segmentation, okay, the participation of the audience. Now let's go to the interaction here. I'll be discussing or sharing some, my three, three uh, theories that are actually presenting ideas on our new media or media in general, we have the culture industry. When we refer to the culture industry, we think of Theodore Adorno, that is his theory together with Mark Hartman. Okay, so culture industry describes how media produce certain standards of taste and desire for certain kinds of content to make them buy consumer products. So culture industry is one method, most of the time, of course, of, of business or of companies, you know, they would study what are the things that these people like, and they can now control what to like, they can now control what standards to like, they can now control the taste, what is beautiful to them, what is art to them, and they can now control what people will desire. I believe that having the word trendy, for example, can be very much used here in the culture industry. People, it may be the young ones, it may also be the older ones. You know, we, we always look at or we always look for what is trendy, 
what is new, what do people like actually at this time? So that is one strategy of new media specifically in their, in, in their ways of making people like something the same or similar or identifying kind of taste should you have as an audience. There's another one, the false identity of universal and particular. This, uh, the idea of false identity of universal and particular actually or mass culture already has no need to present themselves as art. Before we would say, oh, this uh, film production is art, this presentation is art, this song is art. But now they openly and directly show themselves already as forms of businesses. Okay, so it would always go back to consumerism, to capitalism. But I'm not the one saying that. It's the false identity of universal and particular idea. And then the third one is standardization. Standardization may be quite similar to culture industry. Because standardization would be uh, providing something that is um, produced using the mass production and the use of standard products. As its definition, it is said that it can be a cycle of manipulation. Why do you consider this a cycle of manipulation? Because it's, it's what everybody is using. That is not the standard. Even if, let's say, for example, you prefer the older version of that item or the older version of that product because of standardization, they are now obsolete. We change, as we, say, as we said a while ago, new media is always uh, new, okay? Or it is new. So standardization also scraps the old ideas. And the fourth, something that is um, at, relevant at this time and something that could be produced to many or to almost everyone that is standardization. Now let's go to the idea of participation. Let yeah, us see no. if we have, we actually have influencers here. Do we actually have people? Are you able to influence other people in the use of new media? How much are we influenced? How much are our ideas affected? by what we see or what we hear in the media. So we have this social influence. So when we say social influence, this is the process where it may be a person or it may be uh, a film or it may be some DVDs that would um, influence or affect other people's decisions, actions, and attitudes. So that's the idea of social influence. It also includes patterns of persuasion. They also include a pattern of coercion. Are you forced to subscribe? Like when, for example, you're just trying to read an article, but before you can continue the article, you have to subscribe first. I think that's a very good example of coercion. And then we also have competition and expertise. Excuse so me, Dr. Is... Manilin. Yes, yes, uh, ma'am. You still have five minutes left to present your topic. Okay, okay. okay Thank yeah. you. Thank, Thank you. you so much, ma'am. Yeah. So going back to social influence, we also have the opinion leaders. These people, they are the people who affect how other people Think or yeah, they 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 can change how a people uh, behave or think. And the last one is the online networks. How many relationships are we able to build? Okay. Now for the market of attention for the new media, especially when it's related to business, their aim is to influence your behavior, our behavior. Their aim is to make us uh, buy, for example. Okay. And there is also the idea that no persuasion happens if no one is listening or reading or watching, which is true. And attention is very important. Attention is the key. Attention is also the portal to people's minds. 
Okay? And then we also have these ideas true. Something may be true depending on its correspondence. Is it evident? Depending on the structure of the sentence, is it true based on the sentence? Or is it true pragmatically basing it on its use? We also have the idea of post-truth. Post-truth means we are carried away or we let our emotions control us without any more being rational or without any more considering what are the facts. Okay, and then we also have these seven types of mis and dis information, which is actually available. You can see this online, just like the seven types of mis and dis information. I would just like to remind you that not everything that we see, especially in the new media, could be considered as true. And we have um, organizations that actually regulate, you know, how language is produced, how communication is produced. We also have the ideas of our attitudes towards offensive language in television and film. You know, only us can actually control what we receive. Only us can actually uh, filter what we receive from the new media. Okay, that's why we have here the self-regulation. And definitely media itself is making its way to regulate what we also receive as communication in the new media media and that would be all for my presentation thank you so much and good afternoon thank you dr manilin for sharing such valuable insights yeah on the topic the language of new age media so uh, what i can conclude from your uh, presentation uh, that is the new language has some characteristics especially the one about digital type. And then there are three aspects that are related to the understanding of the new age language. Uh, they are the audience, interaction, and participations. And then for the students of English language teaching education, uh, the implication is that you have to possess the mastery of the vocabulary to teach to your students. Yeah, So your students can help their English learners not only understand but also produce this particular kind of language. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Manilin. Now we will uh, move forward to our next speaker who will continue discussing the topic that is about uh, phonological awareness and digital literacy. Uh, before we uh, welcome Ibu Dr. Sukma, I will share the her curriculum vitae yeah uh, her name is dr sukma nur adini ss mpd and then she yeah she is uh, graduated from universitas negeri semarang yeah she got her doctoral degree in 2020 and then uh she got grants yeah in researches, yeah, within the last five years, which is uh, from internal of UCRIS and then from the government, yeah. After that, she also got the grant, yeah, in the community service, yeah, within the last five years, from 2017 up to now, yeah, 2023. And she also had many publications from 2017 up to now, 2020, oh, up to 20, 2022. Okay, it seems that she has a lot of, uh, I mean, she's productive. Yeah. She produced many... Uh, yeah, researches, yeah, articles. Okay, uh, without waiting uh, any longer, yeah, we will listen. Uh, yeah, we will uh, to Sukma's yeah, presentation. Okay, please welcome Dr. Sukma Nur Adini, SSMPD. Yeah, please, Thank Sukma. You. 
thank you moderator ma'am Chichi and I would like to uh, send my congratulations to Dr. Min for a very informative uh, presentation you had. Thank you very much. I also learned from you. And okay, let me share the screen first. All right, MTT, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon to all the committee, colleges and participants in collaboration between Universitas PGRI Semarang, Indonesia and Don Mariano Marcos Memorial State University, the Philippines in the event of international lecture series. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And in this, in this wonderful event, I would like to share one crucial issue that remains in teaching phonology, which is my uh, teaching, teaching uh, area, teaching uh, focus yeah, in teaching phonology. And that is how to effectively teach phonological awareness to students and how uh, can digital literacy relate to phonological awareness in language teaching atmosphere, mostly in the implementation of the latest curriculum in Indonesia and in the era of the fourth industrial revolution or 4.0. All right, uh, phonological awareness is a key concept in the field of language and literacy development. And there are many experts who have contributed to the understanding of phonological awareness and its role in reading and writing development. These experts uh, have helped to shape our understanding and how phonological awareness develops and how it can be effectively assessed and taught. Also, how it interacts with other components of reading and writing. Let me go first with Kilpatrick 2015. According to Kilpatrick, uh, phonological awareness is the ability to attend and manipulate the sounds of language. This includes the ability to segment words, uh, into their individual sounds or phoneme, blend sounds together to form words and manipulate sounds within word or such as substitute one sound for another. David Kilpatrick is an expert, if I can say, uh, in the field of reading development and has written extensively on the role of phonological awareness in reading acquisition. His book, is very famous, Essentials of Assessing, Preventing, and Overcoming Reading Difficulties. Kilpatrick emphasizes in this book uh, the importance of phonological awareness and its relationship of reading development. The second expert, we go with Catherine Snow, 2001. She also uh, published her book, entitled Reading for Understanding. This is a very famous as well. Reading for Understanding toward an R&D program in reading comprehension. She defines phonological awareness as the ability to detect, manipulate, or analyze the sound structure of words independent of their meanings. Snow here emphasizes that phonological awareness is a crucial component of early literacy development, as it provides the foundation for decoding and word recognition skills. So, uh, compared to Kilpatrick, Snow here come up and emphasize with the foundation of decoding and word recognition skills. And the third expert is Isabel Beck, 
2013, 2013, she is a prominent researcher in the field of reading development and has contributed significantly to our understanding of phonological awareness. In her book entitled Bringing Words to Life, Robust Vocabulary Instruction, she defines phonological awareness as the ability to identify and manipulate the sounds of language in spoken words. Beck is also uh, Beck also notes that phonological awareness is a skill that can be developed through explicit instruction and practice, and that is closely related to other key reading skills such as decoding and word recognition, uh, the same as Catherine Snow. And the last expert I would come up with, Dr. Lucia Motz. She is a re-owned re expert in the field of literacy development and has made significant contribution to our understanding of phonological awareness. According to her, phonological awareness is the conscious awareness of the sound structure of language, including the ability to perceive and manipulate the sounds of spoken words. Most uh, modes emphasizes that Phonological awareness is a crucial component in early literacy development as it provides the foundation for decoding and word recognition skills. So, uh, what, why, yeah, why is phonological awareness important? Um, seeing from the previous slides that it always relates to decoding, yeah, and then reading skill, yeah, and about sound and phoneme, yeah. So why is phonological awareness important? I got five points in here. So the reason is because the foundation, because the phonological awareness is the foundational skill for reading, because explain, uh, it's explaining how sound works in different ways in a word. And phonological awareness is the ability to blend and segment phonemes, predict reading skills, again, reading, and then ability to identify and distinguish between sounds in a word. All right, so uh, we can say that by reading this slide, it is important uh, to have phonological awareness since it is a foundational skill for literacy development. All right, now uh, in this slide, we see that phonological awareness is in fact an umbrella term and then all the different subsets of the phonological awareness are underneath as the raindrops here. Here is the umbrella and then here are the rain, raindrops. So we're going to just go through and talk about each of the subsets of phonological awareness. And they begin over here from the first, uh, my left side, and then uh, here, this one, this part is the most simplistic. And we go to the right side to the most complex over here. Okay, I will explain it one by one. So we'll start here with word awareness. I usually ask students to be able to listen to a sentence and break the sentence up into individual words. So this is something that usually I do in the beginning of semester. So I will ask the students to identify and count how many words in the sentence. So if they can hear the sun is hot, yeah, when I say the sun is hot, so they can hear it's, it consists of four different separated words. What are they? Four. 
what are they? The sun is hot. All right. And that will be this part. It, it's called word awareness. And then we move to the rhyme awareness or N, alliteration. So let's talk about rhyme awareness first. So when we talk about the rhyme, we're talking about the vowel and what comes after the vowel. So in this in the rhyme, in the sun here, I got sun and bun. So the rhyme will be on an and the bun in the word bun, the rhyme also is on an an sound. So we would say that this word has rhyme, his uh, both words, sun and bun, is rhyming since they have the same rhyming unit. Now, we talk about alliteration. Okay, uh, we're talking about the same initial sound or the same beginning sound. So I got here the word funny and friend. They both start with a f sound. So that will be an example of alliteration since they both have the same beginning sound. Now we move on to syllable awareness. Now, this is the first time we really ask the students to break words apart. This one is uh, quite difficult for my students. So they need to break words apart into syllables. And we start with compound words to make it easier for the students. We start with, for example, here I got cow and boy. Yeah, if they can hear that those are individual words, two separate words, boy and cow, or cow and boy. And then when we put them together, it becomes cow, cowboy. Yeah, it's much easier to start with compound words. And then I got another, yeah, not the compound word. Here I got planet. Yeah. What if we ask the students to uh, make, to break the word planet into two syllables? Yeah. That would be hard for my students since they know that this is one word. One word different from cowboy. Yeah, and then uh, we will find that the first syllable, the first syllable will be plan. Yeah, and the second syllable will be at planet. All right, and then we're going to move on the, the onset rhyme awareness number four from the left side. So, uh, the onset rhyme awareness of a word is just the beginning sound. So in the word back, I got the word back there. And then in the word back, back is the onset. And then as we said before, the rhyme unit will be the act card. Yeah, act card in the vowel and what comes after. Sorry, that follows. So back, uh, the onset of back is back. And the rhyme of the word back is ek. So the student will break the word into the onset and the rhyme. Sometimes the onset might be a blend. For example, I got another word, which is uh, more, which is harder, way harder for my students. For example, here, train. So the onset might be blend. For example, t and er together say ter. So that would be the onset, and then a sound a diphthong, and then an sound says a. And that 
will be the rhyme. So if the students were asked to break up train into the onset and the rhyme, it will be terrain, terrain, that way. And this is the first time at this level where the students are taking one syllable words and starting to break it apart and then gets them ready for what they're going to be doing next. And what will be the next? The next is phoneme awareness. And this is the most complex among all of the phonological awareness skills. And typically the phoneme awareness uh, is where many students end up struggling and having some difficulties. All right, to discuss what phoneme awareness, let's discuss what a phoneme first. What is phoneme? Phoneme. Anybody knows? All right, I will help you out. Uh, a phoneme is simply the smallest unit of sound. So I got the word cat there can be broken up into three phonemes or sounds. And that will be an example of phoneme awareness. Uh, the ability of students to be able to first hear and identify the individual sounds and phonemes so far, uh, for instance, is cat. So cat has three phonemes, k, a, and t. All right. So at this point for the phonemic awareness, we as the educators need to teach the students to the most advanced level of phonemic awareness since it is the foundation foundation of reading and writing skills. Okay, we go on the next slide. It's about another source also emphasizes the reading success is comprised of several units, several skills, not only one skill. Look at the continuum. So the phonological awareness continuum is made up of six different skills. We have rhyming, alliteration, sentence segmentation, syllable segmentation, onset and rhyme. I just explained uh, earlier. And then the last is phonemic awareness. So again, phonemic awareness exists under the umbrella of the phonological awareness as the most complex skill. So the students start practice how to identify and manipulate individual sound. All right. So uh, you see that experts agreed that phonological awareness refers to the ability to identify and manipulate the individual sounds or phonemes that make up words. It is an important, since it is a foundation skill, it is a foundation skill, very, very crucial skill for reading and writing, which is uh, we call literacy development. This one, phonological awareness, and uh, it may support the high or the low uh, literacy development of our student. And in this slide, I will come up with the question, this one. And the question is how can digital literacy relate to phonological awareness and literacy development in language teaching atmosphere, mostly in, in, in the implementation of Campus Merdeka in Indonesia and the revolution. Industry 4.0. Oh. Okay. Now let us see the next slide. There is about digital literacy. Now we move to another topic. Here is digital literacy. I come up uh, as well with the definition from some experts. And the first is from Erstat et al. 2016. They said that digital literacy uh, involves man, man, more than the ability to use software or operate a digital device. It includes a large variety of complex cognitive, motor, sociological, and emotional skills which users need to perform tasks effectively to critically evaluate digital media. 
if you see below uh, for the other three expert they will say uh, sort of sort of uh, the same as what expert the first expert has said i took another three from martin and grud sieki 2006 and then i took um from organization not an, an author uh, and uh, digital literacy okay and then digital, digital literacy framework 2018 and the last one from Jenkins et al. Jenkins et al. 2006. Overall, from those experts, we can say that this uh, definition uh, highlight the importance of digital literacy in today's society. In today's society, it deals with technology, and then emphasize the wide range of skills and competencies required to effectively navigate and participate in the digital world. All right. Mm. So let's go back to this slide. To answer the question here, after you read and hear my uh, explanation for my previous slide, so what is the answer for this? All right, I will help you again. Okay, the answer is yes. Phonological awareness and reading development can support digital literacy. They support each other. So the, the next question will be how? How they support each other? Uh, in this slide, I in purpose picked this image. <laughs> this image with the word how and the magnifying glass in the letter O. So the students will be aware of pronouncing this word. Uh, ow. Yeah, let's read how instead of ho. Yeah, this is uh, still problematic to my students in Indonesia. Yeah, hopefully it will be a reminder for all of you. Well, okay, back to the main questions. So how can digital literacy support phonological awareness? Some um, research. Yes. Oh, okay. Some research has suggested that the same phonological processing skills that are important for reading development may also be important for understanding and using digital media such as video games, social media, digital tools, digital tools such as uh, speech recognition software, interactive games. These also may help you to promote phonological awareness. I have some, uh, some examples for speech recognition software. Uh, here I got Siri and Bixby, also Google Voice. Those are speech recognition that can be found every day in our smartphones. Yeah, Siri is for the Apple users and Bixby is for Android users. They can tell uh, they can tell your pronunciation. So whenever they are able to transfer catch and find the meaning of your pronunciation, it means your pronunciation is acceptable. So you can measure yourself in this uh, speech recognition application software. Reversely, when you say something to them and then they cannot catch, they cannot transfer, they cannot find the meaning of your vocabularies, it means your pronunciation is unacceptable or not yet acceptable. You have tried, you need big efforts to try to try again over and over and over again. Another speech recognition is Focaro.com, this one. Yeah, it is a useful tool free on the internet and the students can record can record their voice and then they can copy the link and paste on the Google form. 
And next is the most famous, <laughs> famous, yeah, famous and uh, wow, thousand millions of users already, already familiar with this application. That is Elsa Speak. Also, uh, research has been wow uh, conducted using this this kind of this this application Elsa Speak. As I speak, it's an application that can help you improve your pronunciation. The wow things is that it can detect user pronunciation errors with accuracy level up to 95%. Wow, 95%. User can receive detailed feedback to correct their pronunciation error. So you will receive percentage, yeah, uh, so how far your pronunciation is correct or incorrect. If it is below 70, so you will be asked to uh, retry and then try again until you got more than 70, 70%. 70 yeah. yeah, okay. And then the next application is EPA, English Pronunciation Application. This one is more detailed in each and every 44 English sounds. Uh, it discusses, it provides every, every sounds. And uh, they got 12 vowels, they got eight diphthongs, and they got 24 consonants in the application. So when you want to be detailed to practice each of the sounds, you can go with this application. All right, next, the sources from YouTube. I took here, mmmenglish.com. It helps you to achieve fluency faster in speaking English. It helps you build confidence and focus on English in their daily life. This is very good. I very recommend this uh, to my students. The, the uh, MMM English or Emma, this, this woman is the creator, and then her name is Emma. She got a lot of technique in the website, and this one, I, I come up with the one of the techniques. It called the imitation technique. So it got uh, three steps, yeah. You listen first and then you uh, read and then after that you imitate or shadowing, yeah. And then reading aloud here all around the world, blah, 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 blah. So it is good for acknowledging how to pronounce new words. Next is social media. Okay, TikTok newscaster. It's good for accuracy, fluency, speed, and vocabulary. Instagram, which is full of challenges to enhance your pronunciation. And this application software and social media, I uh, come up with. Yeah, it also supported by a study by Call for Cat the Swedish National Agency for Education, it found that uh, it found a positive correlation between phonological awareness skills and digital skills in young children. But it it's also uh, can be applied in uh, higher education students, especially, especially in Indonesia. And then other studies have suggested that digital media may also be able to support the development of phonological awareness skills. For example, some researchers have argued that the use of digital tools such as speech recognition software and interactive games may help to promote phonological awareness in children with reading difficulties. All right. And then the next will be about four principles of digital literacy the first about comprehension the first is comprehension uh, comprehension is the ability to extract extract implicit and explicit ideas from a media the second is in the interdependence it is how one media 
form connects with another, whether potentially, metaphorically, ideally, or literally. Due to the sheer abundance of media, it is necessary that media forms not simply coexist, but uh, supplement one and another. The third is social factors. Sharing, uploading your work uh, is no longer just a method of personal identity or distribution, but rather can create messages of its own. After you share, yeah, you share what, who shares what, to whom, yeah, through what channels, cannot only determine the long-term success of the media, but can create organic ecosystem of sourcing, sharing, storing, and ultimately repackaging media. The last is curation. All right. Um, this principle is about when a video is collected in a YouTube channel, a poem maybe ends up in a blog, uh, blog post, or an infographic is pinned to Pinterest or stored in a learning board, there is also a kind of literacy, as well as the ability to understand the value of information and keep it in a way that makes it accessible and useful long-term. So be careful to anything, anything that you upload in YouTube, for example, or in your social media, Facebook, Instagram, yeah, it will be a very, yeah, very long term uh, memory. Yeah, and I think we are not the one who can erase that. Yeah, <laughs> so be careful for that. And next is why is digital literacy important? It is because of Digital literacy enhances students' engagement. It can, we, they can work in collaboration, as I stated in number number three, and then it improves academic uh, performance. It, it also applies to most subject areas and field. Therefore, it can be assume that digital literacy is important as technology and digital media have become integral parts of daily life. So that is the point why digital literacy is very important. Examples of digital literacy skills. Yeah. This variation, checking emails, sending emails, responding emails and then searching browsing in google engine google search engine and use uh, online search to complete assignment or project all right so those can be the variation of for teachers to explore students literacy skills in the form of project based learning Okay, and the next is about concept of digital literacy. The concept of digital literacy can be broken down into uh, how many different skills and competency. I got six. The first one is access. Access is the ability to access digital technologies and information manage the ability to effective manage digital information and then integrate the ability to integrate digital technologies, evaluate it relates to the ability to critically evaluate digital information. So we cannot accept everything yeah, from the social media. We, we need to have critical thinking to be critical, to accept everything from the social media. And then communicate is the ability to communicate effectively through digital media. By, develop, 
by developing yeah. these skills and competencies, individuals or our students can become more digitally literate and better equipped yeah, to navigate the digital world. They can also access and use digital resources effectively. All right. Now I would like to uh, come to the uh, curriculum that is uh, that is hmm, already implemented in Indonesia. It is called Campus Merdeka. It is term used in higher education sector in Indonesia. Campus Merdeka refers to a government initiative aimed at promoting innovation and excellence in higher education by providing greater autonomy and flexibility to universities and other higher education institutions in Indonesia. The second point perhaps can be explained by these eight programs. The eight programs uh, in Curriculum Merdeka. The first one is Pertukaran Pelajar or Student Exchange. It refers to a program in which students from one educational institution travel to another institution, either domestically or internationally. The second one is magang atau praktek kerja or internship, refers to a program in which students or recent graduates gain practical work experience by working for a company or organization for a limited period of time. Mengajar di sekolah or teaching in schools refers to the profession of teaching students uh, in a formal education setting. And research, yeah, research refers to the systematic and rigorous investigation of a topic or question. Proyek kemanusiaan or humanitarian projects. Uh, it is aimed at improving the quality of life for people who are affected by poverty, disasters, conflicts, or other, other humanitarian crises. Kegiatan wira usaha or entrepreneurial activity, which involves identifying and exploiting business opportunities to create new products, services, or processes that meet the needs of consumers. Study or project independent refers to independent study or project. And then membangun desa or KKN thematic refers to the community service, community service activities that are aimed at improving the quality of life for people in rural areas or underserved communities. Those are eight uh, programs in Curriculum Merdeka. Okay, despite these efforts, uh, whole programs, the eight programs that I have explained, there are still significant challenges to promoting digital literacy in Indonesia. One key issue is the lack of infrastructure in some areas, particularly in remote and rural regions, which can limit access to technology and internet. On the last picture, you can see that perhaps the students or the teacher got the laptop, but they, they don't have the connection. So <laughs> it needs to, they need to find one spot that has a good signal and can try to browse or search yeah, using internet for their uh, learning process. Overall, digital, digital literacy is an important area of development for Indonesia. Okay, and then, okay, we go to this slide again. Yeah, overall for this uh, presentation, for my presentation, again, digital literacy, uh, is very important. Yeah, let me uh, briefly restate this main point, my main points. The first one is reading. Yeah, reading is something we do every day. We know that for sure. 
It is imperative that the students understand that spoken words are made up of individual sounds. This is called phonological awareness. Research has demonstrated that phonological awareness is a strong predictor of reading success. At the same time, the era of technology has also brought challenges. Students must literate in a range of skills. By embracing these challenges and opportunities, and by harnessing our creativity and innovation, we can create a better world for ourselves and future generation. So let's be bold, be daring, and seize the day. Thank you so much for having me. Have a good day. Back to you, my moderator. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Ibu Dr. Sukma Nur Ardini, for your uh, presentation that was uh, truly enlightening and informative. Yeah, yeah, dear participants of uh, familiar with the concepts and uh, with the concepts of oracy and literacy. Yeah, so oracy is concerned with the oral competence or development of the English learners. The theoracy skill include the ability of speaking and listening to enable the learners to communicate and collaborate effectively. Dr. Sukma explained the concepts of phonological awareness, that is uh, the ability to differentiate sounds in syllable and also word levels. She also brought us to learning the concepts of literacy associated with the digital era or digital communication. Uh, in, it is interesting that uh, the two topics we have just followed are related in the same concepts of digital language, that is language in the new age or era. Uh, the digital literacy competence determines the, the English learners whether or not they will later engage in the social communication, such as to create, communicate, collaborate, and solve the social problems. Uh, we still have time for questions and answer by answers by our special uh, speakers yeah and then now let Lynn or Dr. Sukma okay for uh, participants you may directly raise hand by clicking the the raise hand button or you may write down the questions on the chat box, please. Any questions to your participants? No, ma'am. Yeah, they seem to be clear for the two lectures <laughs> from Dr. Zuma and also yeah. Dr. Naman. Yeah. Thank you, Pak Jantan. Thank you, Pak Probably for uh, the participants from DIMSU, do you have any questions to both speakers? Okay, yeah, it seems that uh, there is no questions for both speakers. So if there is no questions, yeah, I conclude that all of you have learned well the two important topics related to the digital era. So both have a lot 
to do with the successful and effective communication in the millennial or digital era. So, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of this enlightening, enlightening and informative uh, lecturers. Yeah. I hope all of you have enjoyed and benefited from the presentations and discussion of our distinguished speakers. I, I would like to thank them once again for their valuable contributions for making these lectures successful. Thank you for all participants who have joined these lectures. Please give big applause for us. Yeah. Okay, uh, and then see you again in the third session of the lecture series next week on the same time. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you, Ma'am Cici, Dr. Manilin. Thank you, Dr. Manilin and Dr. Sukma. Congratulations to all of us. Bye. Thank you, Bu Sukma. Most welcome, Pak Jafar. Thank you, Pak Jafar. Yeah, Bu. Thank you, Pak Jafar, on camp for the whole time. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. I'm honored. on time with with the students in class, actually, Bu Sukma. Oh, I see. Oh, <laughs> okay. What yeah. class, Pak Jafar? What class, Pak Jafar? Translation, maybe. Translation. Translation. Oh, translation. Translation. Okay. translation. Digital translation. Digital <laughs> translation. Wow. So all wow. students are uh, all... in the technology. <laughs> yeah. All translation students join this lecture series. Thank you, Pak Jafar. Thank you, Pak Jafar. Bu Cici. Ya, yeah, thank you. Yeah. 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 Terima thank kasih. Terima kasih. Yeah. Yeah. Have a great day, everyone. Great day too. Bye.